Well, the Faithful Nationals Coalition took to the streets this week in an independent solidarity march in protest of several issues. The group includes the movement, the United Progressive Party, the Barbie the People's Movement, Antigua Barbie the Worker Un Workers' Union, and others. However, it did not include the Democratic National Alliance, DNA, and their leader, Joanne Messiah, explained why. The last time there was, a, there was an effort such as this to protest, I believe it might have been um, somewhere in February or March, somewhere so. And you're telling me you're going to allow an almost six-month period to pass. When you say your mission is to bring down a government, we say, take a second look at your strategy. Because the way it is being advertised and promoted, it looks as though it's purely political. There are some persons, irrespective of which political party or no political party they support, they do not wish to be associated with anything that is one just pure politics or two does not offer an alternative and this is the problem historically that we have had in antigua and barbuda meanwhile when asked this week to explain the decline in support for the united progressive party over recent elections the leader of the opposition jamal pringle seemingly put the blame squarely on messiah now david when you look mm, at the upp over the years. Mm -hmm. What we have seen is the persons mm -hmm. who have been <clears throat> an integral part of the organization have moved mm -hmm. into different organizations where they may be other political parties or even a part of the government. It seems like there's an issue but the issue we're having in UPP it's not an issue of the organization. It's an issue of personal beliefs mm -hmm. and personal advancement that not working out in their interest. So therefore, rather than sticking with the organization, you try to paint a bad picture. And if you were part of an organization, and you go out and you start to paint the picture, even it's a lie, you're going to find persons because you were there, take it and say it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And that is what has been happening to the UPP. So what did we learn from those who did show up for the march this week? Did the protest hit at a rebound for the U hint at a rebound for the UPP, or is the opposition failing to attract new support? Oh, to answer this and more, we have with us today Public Affairs Commentator Colin Knight. Good afternoon. Okay, we'll reconnect you with Colin Knight there. Uh, author Kimalosa Mings, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We also have Political Studies student Kieran Murdoch, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, Mr. Butler, how are you? Youth Ambassador Kamali Mannix, good afternoon. Okay, he's joining us shortly. And social affairs commentator, Kadeem Joseph. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, well, Kim Alosa, let me start with you. Uh, what did the march tell you about the state of the opposition today, and what did you make of the issues they chose to highlight? Well, um, to start off, it's it's not your fault. It's Kim or Lisa. Kim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, I... I think this is where the issue of the march kind of, there is a problem, because we're looking at it as opposition as opposed to government, and I think that is why people haven't been coming out to the marches, because they think of it as part of a group when it should be focused on the issues. So if it's the march we're looking at as, is the op opposition getting support then the opposition is going to get not going to get support because the people don't really care about the opposition. They're more interested in the issues. And if we put that at the forefront, then we will see people marching. But once you're saying, oh, this is this group or that group, then you're not going to see people coming out. The issues are what we should be putting on the forefront because the people that you had put on just a while ago, the DNA and the UPP, they're talking about themselves. They're not talking about us. They're talking about, oh, well, they didn't invite me. We don't care. We don't care. We want, we're caring about our roads. 
and that they are not being repaired, that we are, our, our, our cars are being mm -hmm. damaged. But you're talking about, oh, well, the UPP, us, well, they left us, we don't care. We care about us. And as such, you're not going to see people join those marches because you're looking at, well, this is this group and this is this group. No. Uh, Kadeem, what do you make of the DNA's decision to stay out and how big a, of a loss do you think it was for the faithful nationals? You know, I, I, I don't know that the DNA um, has had a healthy outpouring of support from the regular populace, the regular uh, members of the electorate. I don't know uh, that they have yet to concrete, concretize their, their, their stay on the political landscape of Antigua and Barbuda. So I would have hoped by now they would have worked out some sort of compromise between themselves and the UPP uh, in order to get some sort of headway uh, as it relates to the, the health of the opposition in the, the country. But I think uh, the, the DNA is missing an opportunity to, one, uh, be visible, and two, to garner more support as they try to increase that visibility. Uh, Carl, are you with us now? I'm here, yes. Okay. Uh, Carl, Carl, what, what do you make of the, the, of the makeup of the Faithful Nationalist Coalition? Uh, you heard Kim speaking about it there. Um, uh, and the strategy to protest is part Briefly, of this. Not everything. Uh, okay, so uh, my question to you still, though, is what do you make of the makeup of the Faithful Nationals Coalition? Uh, the strategy to protest is part of that group. Do, do you think it allows those who are maybe upset with government policies but unconvinced with the opposition of platform to join? In principle, I think it's intent to do that. Um, and that was uh, that is supposed to be the. Um, the sort of modus operandi of the fateful nationals um, um, coalition, that it is to say, well, we want to have an independent grouping separate and apart from the political parties, that people who necessarily are not tied to political parties can feel assured that this is something that they can join and, 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 and feel pa patriotic about and, 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 and talk about the issues. The concern is, however, it's not not a concern that is, um, I think, small, is that the people who are at the forefront of the faithful nationals are also people who have had ties to the United Progressive Party in some form, or at least, if not ties to the United Progressive Party, some sort of, they seem to be disgruntled with the Labour Party, let's just put it that way. And so that may make the, the, the organization seem less, impar less impartial than it actually is. Um, I think if it does what it is intended to do, and that is to say, you know, keep keep to the issues, and to hold the government to account, then it should um, engender more support um, uh, as a independent, quote unquote, independent pressure group in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, Kieran, let's look at the issues that came up because um, the coalition looked at several different issues when they called the march, but. They actually used the march to call for the resignation of the Integrity Commissioner. And reports say that they plan to make this their prime focus when they march again this coming week. Uh, what do you make of their focus? Well, I, to be honest with you, uh, and I say this from the perspective of um, somebody who has you know, observed goings on in Antigua from the perspective of a reporter, um, it, it seems to me to be a, a call which is justified. Uh, and it seems that it has been strategically done. Uh, I would say that the current Integrity Commission has come under a lot of fire over the last few years uh, for its inaction on a variety of scandals, for its inability to uh, reach out to the public, to be proactive in engagement, to, to basically do its job at all. Uh, and we have noticed that they have come under criticism. This is the Integrity Commission. The opposition parties, both the United Progressive Party, uh, I mean, the DNA wasn't part of the FN march, uh, but uh, even the DNA has, has criticized the Integrity Commission in the past. The movement has criticized the Integrity Commission. Uh, but as much as they have been criticizing the Integrity Commission, uh, they have not, up until this point, actually called for the commissioner to resign. So uh, I actually see it as a, as a, a strategic move in that they have waited until uh, a significant amount of time has passed, that uh, 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 years have gone into the tenure of the members of the commission, and so that they actually have something to look back on and point to and judge and say, well, look, 
uh, this is their tenure, these are their feelings, and this is why we are calling for their resignation. Okay, we're now being joined by um, Youth Ambassador Kamali Mannix. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Kamali, when we look at the, the issues that came up in the Faithful Nationals March this week, do you, do you think the issues are, that are raised are connecting with people? And do you think, importantly, they're attracting fresh and young blood into the ranks of the opposition? No. That's the reality. <laughs> um, the issues that were presented are important. Don't get me wrong, they are important. But they don't appeal to young people in certain respects. And then even outside of that, you have a situation where the present main opposition party in general, the reality is, and I know I'll get a lot of backlash in my statements today, but I'm a very honest person. The reality is majority of their support base are people who are, you know, 50 up, you know, on that retirement age going up there. Yes, they do have some young people in the party. But the reality is young people count for a very, very small percentage. Their, their base is mostly the accelerated adult, so to speak. Whereas when you look at the support base of the ruling party, their support base is mostly young people. People between the ages of 80 and 40. And then you do have those people who are 50 plus who... You know, my grandfather, you know, stood up to Modi Stoughton Company. So, <laughs> of course, I'm going to support Labour as well. So you see that the support dynamics has a lot to do with how serious they're taken. Because the reality is, if the Labour Party presents something, young people will pick it up. They will listen to it. They will pay keen attention to it. And you have a greater reaction from young people. Whereas the present opposition party, if they present an issue, no matter how important it might be to everybody else, the reality is most young people look at them like, yo, we're going to just go and sit on a hush. I really don't want to hear them at this point. So it's like anything that they do is taken with a grain of salt. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think people are not connected to it? Okay. <sighs> Again, my statements might insult some, but I will go ahead. One, you've had a situation where the present opposition party has been presenting the same policies, the same ideology, for lack of a terminology, from since its inception, and it hasn't changed. So what might have worked in 1970-whatever, when George Walter led PLM, or even in the 1980s when Baldwin Spencer led the UNDP, which eventually amalgamated with others, and became the UPP might not necessarily attract young people in the 21st century. Even beyond that, you'd still have most young people have a bitter taste in their mouth about the present opposition party because majority of them would have grown up when they were in government and would have experienced the bad end of the stick in terms of a lot of their economic policies and how things that have played out, especially after 2007, coming towards the end of their term. So then you have created a situation where when most young people think about UPP, they think about the party of economic ruin, the party of rising um, unemployment, the party of rising poverty, the party of lack of opportunity for young people. So then there is this stigma against them. In my opinion, that's what I have seen to some extent. Well, I, I can see some of the other panelists uh, are going to want to jump in on some of those points, and that, that's great because it'll make a good discussion here. Um, but, but let me come to you, uh, Kim Lisa, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, why do you think that the UPP has been losing support of the last few elections? Uh, and do you see signs that they are learning and admitting to past mistakes? Well, I would say I, I agree with, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Kamali. Kamali, right? <laughs> because while I was in the march, I did see that it was a lot of older people in the march. And I do believe they do have a disconnect with the youth. And I think it's a situation where they think they know everything mm -hmm. and they're not willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And I hope that in this moment that they are being humbled, right? Mm -hmm. And I hope they are listening. And mm -hmm. I hope they, dis they make the decision 
to reach out to y'all and just listen because the rhetoric I'm hearing from them as well is that, oh, this is how it is. This is how we do it. This is, you know what? Mm -hmm. It's an evolving world. The whole, Get um, with the program. Connect with the, connect with the youth. Understand, listen. And what you said, and I'm glad I'm part of this discussion, is because I need to know how you feel. Mm -hmm. I, I was there before in ALP, UPP, ALP again, mm -hmm. right? And I can, I can compare, and I can see where y'all are coming from, whereas you grew up with the UPP, and you do not know anything else, mm -hmm. right? I think they failed because they're not communicating. Right. Exactly. They're not saying what they did well. Mm -hmm. They did not say that the, it was not just Antigua, but it was the world. Mm -hmm. That is why it's not them that you had the economic mm -hmm. situation, mm -hmm. but they did not communicate that. I think it has something to yeah. do with um, there's this whole theory of like party renewal. One of the things I will often mention to my friends, what the present opposition needs is a Tony Blair. Because when Tony, Tony Blair would have become prime minister in the 1990s, mm -hmm. after 18 years of conservative rule, you would have had um, the Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher as mm -hmm. prime minister for 11 years from, what, nine, 1979 to 1990. Then you would have had Sir John Major who would have succeeded her for another mm -hmm. seven years of conservative rule. So in total, you would have had 18 years of conservative government. Mm -hmm. Tony Blair came to lead the Labour Party and he was like, look, we need something new. We need party renewal. And he came up with this whole theory of new Labour. It is the same party, the same people, but we need to adjust our campaigning style, one. Mm -hmm. We need to adjust the way how we run the party, two. Mm -hmm. We need to adjust our ideology, our ideology to accommodate the, the, the present mm -hmm. and realizing that most people are no longer hard left or hard, light or hard right. Most people are somewhere along the center. Mm -hmm. where they can see both political spectrums and kind of see where they can fuse together. Mm -hmm. So Tony Blair realized, okay, the Labour Party has been looking at our policies the same way. And that is why every single time we go to the polls, we're defeated and we're defeated miserably. Because during the age of the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, as they called her, she literally dominated politics and no matter who led the Labour Party, they could not stand toe to toe with her. Mm -hmm. So John Major was a bit more timid, but still, you still had this challenge where the Conservative Party overexerted their will over, over the electorate because they had the ability. So I think what now needs to happen in the present opposition, there needs to be some level of party renewal because mm -hmm. if they continue on the present track that they are on, in five years and they go back to the polls it is going to be a 2018 it is going to be a 2014 the same thing is going to happen over and, and over again. and over and they don't realize that well yeah. let me come back to you kamali but i want to bring in kadeem here because mm -hmm. I, I know you wanted to make a point as well but uh, i want to ask you about the tone of the upp because the upp is often accused of opposing for opposing sake of being bitter or envious what do you make of the tone of the United Progressive Party and the opposition, and are they getting it right? I mean, I, I think one of, the, one of the things a lot of young people uh, have been somewhat um, disenchanted by is that there was no uh, penance paid. You know, there, was no, it, there wasn't a repentant stage uh, from the UPP, and I think that's what we needed mm -hmm. uh, because UPP came on the scene as this um, altruistic sort of party. Uh, we came, they, they campaigned on this uh, theme of uh, whatever is wrong, we'll make it right, and whatever right is, will remain. And I don't think a lot of people saw that sort of move into the realm of, of getting Antigua cleaned up. Uh, and, and outside of that, when they did try, uh, in the case of the, the, the trilogy of um, legislation uh, that helped to bring forward the Integrity Commission, we are now seeing that it was almost in vain because there, there, there's no actually there's no teeth to these uh, legislation. So I think UPP uh, fell short of somewhat delivering on the promises of a government that would change Antigua for the better. And now, uh, when they come on the airwaves, it's almost as if they, they want to sidestep the fact that this thing happened. Uh, I think what they need to do now is uh, be apologetic. And after mm -hmm. that, <laughs> after that, then you can start uh, regaining support. Uh, and this is outside of the fact that they had a, a dismal campaign in the last general election. <laughs> they had a dismal slate uh, that could not inspire 
old or young people to vote for them. So there needs to be some sort of penance there. And mm -hmm. then we move forward because people will not take them seriously. Because that was lacking in my opinion. And a after 2014, I, I, they I, I, just come on, didn't he, go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to you, Kamani, and, and Kim as well. Mm -hmm. But Carlon, let me ask you then about this question of renewal because the Faithful Nationals Group, it brings together other leaders, you know, the likes of Alistair Thomas, Serpent, Cleon Attell and more. Uh, do you see this moving towards a place where they may become candidates in a revamped opposition? And if so, is that the right direction? Right. So um, I just want to talk about a couple of things. Um, on the issue, so on that point, I don't want people to get the impression that the opposition party needs to be the opposition in Antigua and Barbuda because they're two separate things. So what we need is opposition to the government, that is certain. And in the absence of a main opposition party who is providing this sort of leadership, it is important that the faithful nationals and other entities who have a stake in the governance of the country, people who have a stake in the governance of the country, um, come together and say, this is the problem that we have. We can sort out the electioneering and the campaigning at some point, but this, this whole idea of marching, protesting, uh, civil disobedience in a whole is an idea that is rooted in the civic, civic, um, civics of the country. So that people who have an interest in the country's governance should come out and say, this is what I have a problem with. And they should not have to wait on the United Progressive Party or any party for that matter to provide that kind of leadership. Now, on the question of the United Progressive Party itself, I agree with some of the points that Kamali said in terms of the packaging and so forth, um, the need for renewal. It's clear that, to my mind, the United Progressive Party thinks that its strategy is going to work. The same issues that it has done is going to work. Uh, and that bringing back the same cast in terms of its leadership structure is going to work. I don't know that it is. They are convinced that it seems to be so, but we wait for them to, to, to we wait for the, the results of that to, to, um, to play out. On the whole issue, however, of youth and the Labour Party, I want to ask a serious question. What is it so attractive about the Labour Party? And young people must not allow themselves to become gimmicks or to become tools to be used. So if we think that the Labour Party is attracting young people with you know, bringing in artists and bringing in reggae singers and bringing in all kind of, of, all kind of fly-by-night gimmicks, then there needs to be more substance. And young people in Antigua and Barbuda have got to get, hold politicians to the, to the fire and act and demand for more substance. And so what is it that the Labour Party is doing to hold and attract young people must be asked. Are they delivering on substance? Are they winning the message on, on policies? Are they winning the message, messages on, on, on youth issues? What are these youth issues? Who are the youth leaders in the party? So these are questions I think need to be asked. And so I think young people need to be more discerning and look beyond just the gimmicks and look at the substance of what the parties are also offering if we're going to be fair to the UPP and the ALP. Kieran, um, Colin says it's not just about the UPP, but I'm going to ask you about the UPP because political analysts like Peter Wickham, Dr. David Hines, they've suggested that the fate of the United Progressive Party is mainly tied to the strength of their leader. Harold Lovell. Uh, but how important do you think the strength of the Remain in Slate is? And um, with a very inexperienced Slate alongside him, do you think Harold Lovell has been getting enough support in that regard? Uh, you know, I would, I would respond to that by saying, um, and it, it goes to the point that one of the other panelists already mentioned, that the United Progressive Party did itself uh, a massive disservice, uh, a mortal wound, when it allowed a Slate of and I have to be totally frank, unimpressive and inarticulate candidates to stock uh, its it, 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 it candidacy for the last election. I mean, I, I have met people uh, during the 2018 campaign who said that they voted for the Democratic National Alliance, even though they knew that that would have been a wasted vote because the UPP candidate running in their constituency, they, they did not, they just, they couldn't bear to vote for that person. Now, of course, only a few people voted for the DNA, so... Uh, this is a small group of people. But I say that to say, you know, if you look at the statistics for the last election, there were an, a, a number of people who clearly did not come out and vote for the United Progressive Party, who did in the last election. You could see that from the numbers, in that they would have gone down from 17,000 in the last election, or the last last election, to 14,000, or thereabouts, in this last previous election. Uh, and so... The slate is critical. You really can't expect to uh, <clears throat> seize the imagination of the population. You really can't expect, expect to excite anybody if you are presenting a candidate who does not have the capacity to speak. And I know that people really don't like to hear this, and I know that it sounds harsh, but I think Antiguans and Barbudans need to acknowledge that they really need to 
put the best people forward. And if somebody brings you, I mean, uh, uh, for instance, take, take, take the leader of the opposition. And again, I know people don't like to hear this. The leader of the opposition, and I would ask other members on this panel whether or not they are impressed when the leader of the opposition <coughs> gives delivery to the parliament. I would ask that question. Is anybody impressed by Jamal Pringle? Nope. Go on. Nope. Sorry, no. <laughs> not at all. I find it kind of repetitive because most times when he does get up to debate, he says the same one thing. Um, I thought there should have been more consultation. And then we sit in expectation. Okay, consultation how? And what would have exactly. been the result? <laughs> and we are go going make this statement? <laughs> I find the reason. I Thank find you. the reason that he does this. I find the reason that he does this. It's most likely because, well, I mean, number one, the, 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 the individual himself does not have the, the, the uh, has not done the level of research or uh, does not have the capacity to bring forward his views in a sensible manner that can be understood well, by people and can impress yeah. people. But I, I think, so no, I no, think... No, no, but I mean, I think, I think I, I, in, in response to that, Colin, I would say that you may say we all have to start somewhere, but this, there must be a certain standard for the starting ground. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't expect to go into what is a job where half of your work is speaking and you cannot speak you can't captivate people you can't keep the uh, but i think i think where we're at right now in just in if you look at the political landscape of antigua and barbuda is that we hold both parties at a different standard uh mm -hmm. in general uh we we want substance from the upp and it's almost as if we don't have that same demand of the alp and uh there was a question earlier asked uh where, where what is it that is the pull that the alp has on, on on especially our young people and i think there's an entertainment value that the alp offers that that the upp doesn't have and and there's a, a lingo that they have that the the, the upp has not been able to tap in if you look at gaston brown's presence on social media alone uh, and you read the comments on the, his his posts and who's sharing his posts it's young people because they uh, right now in the age that we're in mm -hmm. uh we we are enjoying the drama we want the entertainment we want that capt captive captivity and the upp is not that active uh so we also have to to look at that and, and look at what we are asking from both parties can i add to that i think to what plays a heavy influence is this whole theory of communication and interaction mm -hmm. From the Labour Party standpoint, and this is one thing that I've always, always applaud them for, there is always constant dialogue. Whether in government or outside of government, there's always a face-to-face, -face, well, face-to-face -face in very loose quotations, interaction with people. Before they would have come into power in 2014, I know I'm... Um, Mm, what's his name? The government's chief of staff and the president minister of health would have had that show on ZDK Fire and Steel, mm -hmm. used to call it, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So there was a constant dialogue with people. Even coming into the whole 2017, 2018, 2019, every Saturday, as much as possible, the prime minister has that, the, the brown and brown show. So there's a constant dialogue. Whenever there is an issue, the government is not afraid to speak up or to have some sort of dialogue, whether it is full of content so or whether it is Gaston, full, Gaston Brown. Or, well, at least, at least the head of the government, even if it's full of um, bluff and buster, he, there's some sort of dialogue. When you look on the opposition side now, you hear them every once in a while. Before this fateful um, national match or um, solidarity match, what was the last thing? that the UPP has done to really catch people's attention. Well, Can I ask Kamali, I'm going to come to you, Kim Lisa, but Kamali, I wanted to ask you that when we look at the bigger picture, you know, it, it, it's often said that our politics here does focus on personalities, not issues. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that to be the case? And again, returning to this question, if you think that to be the case, do you think the opposition has the right personalities? Okay. Yes, our, our politics kind of looks on personality. And I, and I will tell you how I view it and the observations that I've made. Because I'm very young, but I'm also very observant. Our politics does descend along a line of personalities. And this is the main evidence you can see. Coming from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s politics, you will find that people were infatuated with the Cornwall bird. And if you were to ask them, who were five members of V.C. Byrd's cabinet when he became Prime Minister in 1981. They cannot answer you. 
They might be able to pull, you know, they might say, um, you know, Ernest Williams because they remember him to a certain extent. But then their main focus has always been VC. Coming into the 1990s, you, you had that personality in the form of Lester Byrd. And even now, our Prime Minister does have a personality that is... Um, it is it is Bolsters, it is right. in your face ratchet this, it, it's it's this well uh, well not those words <laughs> darling i ain't gonna get sued for defamation oh, okay. but <laughs> he does have this personality that it draws people towards him for whatever reason it is left to each person but he does so, so i think it, personality are the, are the fortunes does the opposition play. tied to the, the leader then they just change the leader change their fortunes i think okay now, I respect the present leader of, of UPP because one thing I can say about him, he is a people person. I've had multiple interactions with him. He is a people person. However, when it comes to being a great political character, I don't, I would necessarily pin that to him, even though I have a high level of respect for him. And it's not even just an Antigua thing. If you look in Barbados presently, Barbados would lick the ground that Mia Motley walks on at this present moment in time because she has that character that has said, okay, we realize what has happened in the past. We are now in government. We got this. Let's stay the course. And she has that constant repetition. And the members of her party feed into the ideology and feed into creating this vision of their prime minister that yes she can and she does have the ability so it does help even here you find that our prime minister is a personality and the members of his cabinet it's like when they have to speak they cannot speak without making some level of mention of the involvement of the prime minister so then they too help to feed into this um idea as to who he is and how great or how extensive his powers are, so to speak. But then the personality does make a difference. Baldwin Spencer was that personality in the 1990s. He was that personality in the 2000s. And he kind of had that, that ability or that same type of view as the Prime Minister has now. Of course, coming down to the later years, it dwindled. And I think it dwindled when members of his party started to challenge him for the leadership. So then even them, they caused a bit of faction in the party where you now had a certain amount of people who no longer were supporting him or who no longer saw him as this um, bringer of lack of corruption and this person who he was prior to him coming into office. Because his, his, the, the majority of what he was pushing for was a transparent government, government in the interest of the people, and government that includes all that is what he stood on and that was his main platform that is what created this personality coming down to the end you started to have members of his own cabinet oh um he's not that much of a good leader of course i am paraphrasing mm -hmm. but in a very more diplomatic way he's Sorry, not really that much of a good leader he, stuff uh, like that colin hold on there because kim lisa is going to come in here first oh i got so caught up <laughs> <laughs> Can I say pass? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, because I, I know you had a point you wanted yeah. to make there. So, Colin, go right ahead then. So, the cult of the personality is a very real thing in Caribbean politics. That much we know, that personality is a huge part of the way we've done politics for quite a while. Um, and so people get caught up with this idea of the cult of the personality. Um, and so definitely communication is an issue, packaging is an issue, any opposition must, must seriously consider how it brings across its message and the most effective way of doing so. But I also want to think that as young people, and this is a panel of youth, we are moving beyond the cult of the personality because we have been the, been the beneficiaries of education that other people in the 1960s, 1950s didn't have. We have been the beneficiaries of public education, we have the beneficiaries of tertiary education in some respects. We are the ones that today are supposed to be the most discerning, the most quote-unquote educated of all, all of the generations coming forward and i would hate to think that it is all that all that matters to us is this personality aspect of politics do we read the policy documents do we listen to the statements that are being made by our leaders do we interrogate the statements beyond just personality and how, how well that they're, sta they're, they're stating do we read between the lines do we go beneath the surface how critical are we as young people and i think we need to become more critical minded as young people if we're going to be serious about the politics of Antigua and Barbuda, and I am going to inherit it at one point, right? So, I mean, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said about the Labour Party and its engaging of the youth, 
But at the same time, I don't want us to get carried away with this cult of the personality to the point where you lose the substance of the message. And the question is, for beyond the personality, are you satisfied with the state of affairs of the country and the way it's been governed? Are you satisfied with public infrastructure? Well, are you satisfied with... with, with, with um, you may not be working for salaries, but I mean, are you satisfied with the issues and how they're being handled? And this is something in the absence of a vocal opposition, we as the young people need to be far more critically engaged to hold this government to account. Because if we get carried away with this cult of the personality, then they're going to go and do, do whatever they want. And no one is going to be holding their feet to the fire and to make sure that they're held, being held accountable. And that is important, I think. Kim Lisa. Yeah, I'd like to jump in here because you're, you're kind of making an assumption that everyone has made it to tertiary education. You're assuming that we're well, supposedly well, educated because secondary. there is also an issue whereas some people have not even come out of secondary school. Some people have not finished secondary school. And these people are also voters and they are easily swayed. No, I, 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 don't, I, I wouldn't want to... to to uh, want us to veer there because for me and I think Carlin, Carlin's point though valid the question is when are we taught to care who who is that wh wh when do you learn what your civic duty as as a member of Antigua and Barbuda society when do you learn that and I think this is something that we have shied away from from a, as a country and that is the issue of civics I think somehow some way starting at primary school there must be some way that we teach people that you're not looking for a handout but you're looking for the development of antique and barbie i don't think we're, we're there as yet right and i Kay. think that there's also a disconnect because the people think that the government is this there's a disconnect everybody's trying to make a living people are just trying to survive and they see the government as they think of it as a game. It's basketball. It's football. It's between those two people. This has nothing to do with us. Can they don't even realize that their taxes Can are actually coming from there. So Can there's a disconnect. Camelisa, I want to put a question to you because I hear suggestions, and I, I often hear suggestions coming from the opposition as well, that it's almost like the people are to blame. You know, we're not doing well because it's all the people's fault because they, 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 they no, don't I'm, get these I'm issues. Not, I'm not blaming um, the people. But what I want to ask you is what is the opposition getting right at this point in time, and what are they getting wrong? That's interesting because I'm not thinking of anything that they're doing right. I see them trying things and seeing them doing what they've been doing before and not recognizing that this is just a different time. And I agree with Kamal where he's um, saying that the Prime Minister is, is communicating with the people. They're, he's communicating directly, right? Whereas the UPP leadership, he's more getting on the radio stations like Observer or even Crusader and I know the kids are not listening to, to Crusader radio at all. right I you kind of connect directly to them go in the spaces that they have no choice but to see you right and I'm um, yes the prime minister personalities and whatever but you can speak on the issues I'm feeling that it's just us them but they need more than you, what they're doing is not. Could you more want to throw in another factor mm -hmm. here? Because when it comes to winning elections, um, money matters, right? And if we look at the money issue, it, it's said under our system of finance and elections, if the political executive frustrates enough of the business class, they get the money behind them, and the money, the money the, sorry, goes to the opposition, and then they, they can use that to get back in power. Um, but one of the factors that has been brought out is that with now the advent of the Citizenship and Investment Programme, and these types of investors who have wealth that dwarfs those of the local business community. Do you think that is becoming an avenue for the financing of elections, and do you think that will complicate matters for future elections in Antigua? Yeah, I'll tell you this. When, when, when we were covering the Mahul Chuxi saga, uh, one of, the, one of the, the news agencies in India went as far as to say that the government, the government ministers were somehow involved in a huge cover-up. This was what was reported. And uh, because of the nature of CIP and the fact that the government officials have so many tendrils in it, you, you, you can see the room for corruption to exist. However, but it's not necessarily corruption if you go to an investor to fund your political party. That's, that's allowed. 
But True, but what, what I'm trying to say is you can see how you can gain access to people who are willing to fund you personally because, and, and even with that, you, you have a case where you may be fleeing um, whatever you're fleeing from, wherever you're coming from, and you have someone who's willing to say, hey, I will handle this for you. So you, there's a sense of, um, sense of, I owe this to this person then. So I think in, in the future elections, elections to come, we may see a lot of, uh, of these big time investors leaning towards the party that helped them to, to gain their citizenship. Uh, just as we see with individuals uh, who, who migrate to Antigua and they go to a politician and the politician helps them to gain citizenship. There's a sense of, I owe you. There's a sense mm -hmm. of a quid pro quo. Yeah, yeah, you help me, I'm gonna help you to stay in power. And we have seen this and I think this this, while I never thought about it this before, I think uh, looking towards future elections, this indeed may be one of those um, issues that we have to look at and look at critically as it relates to the development of Antigua and who are our politicians really serving? Is it the people or is it um, uh, or other individuals who don't necessarily live here? But I think this is my issue. Or this is my, and this is my standpoint when I look at the politics of Antigua and Barbuda. Our, our system of government gives way for politicians, especially whomsoever occupies the office of prime minister, to exert an extreme amount of power. Because as prime minister, you are automatically lead of the legislature, which is parliament, because you command the majority. You are automatically head of the civil service because that is your constitutional role. You automatically, cre you automatically control the direction of the civil service's key organ, which is cabinet, because again, you are first among equals, according to um, political science, as the, the leader of the government. In addition to that, in our constitution, the prime minister appoints the majority members of the um, Boundaries Commission, Police Service Commission, Public Service Commission. Mm -hmm. He appoints the majority members on the Electoral Commission, the Integrity Commission. Every single statutory body that has a board of directors, every single one of them gets the appointment by cabinet. And they're usually people whom are of great favor to the prime minister, whomever it might be. So then essentially... You have one person mm -hmm. occupying an office and I control every single organ of the state, whether it is directly under the purview of a government ministry or a statutory body that stands outside or some level of commission that has to execute a certain amount of responsibility. So the reality is, and I've said this before, I don't necessarily see it as corruption. I see it as somebody really taking advantage of the power they have because corruption it really is rooted in you getting into something that you have no business in no this is the reality if i do not want x to sit or to occupy a certain office in the police force i have appointed the majority of the members on the police service commission so if they are considering x for the position i just have to call the three people whom technically work for me and i can say hello that person should never occupy that office and guess what that's scary that's a who employ you you're going to go with it the majority of the members of the senate the house of the house of senators are appointed by the government mainly upon the advice of the prime minister now we look at a case that happened a few years ago where was a situation where they were given the public notice it is either you are going to pass my legislative agenda mm -hmm. or you resign or i will well, put you out of this place come on what so, so then come on yeah, i'm taking your points here but I, it's, a, it's a very valid discussion and, and one that we've had and i think dr paget henry talks about this mm -hmm. accumulation of power as well um but i do want to focus the discussion on the opposition because that's what we're here discussing today uh I, and i want to bring in kieran in this regard um kieran how much does the youth vote play into things? Because we've spoken about the youth a lot today. Uh, how important is that in an election? And what do you think the opposition needs to do to pose a viable challenge in the next election? Well, in terms of the youth vote, I think we could all agree that that is critical. Um, another story from covering the last election, I, I remember being in the front of the crowd um, for Observer uh, when the Labour Party had its victory rally. And what I did notice was that 
uh, at least 25% of the individuals at that victory rally were very, 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 very young. Uh, and there were uh, throngs of people who I would dare say could not vote. But regardless of the fact that they couldn't vote, they were nonetheless out in their, in their party paraphernalia, uh, and they were celebrating the party victory. Uh, and I think that is because the Labour Party, over time, has demonstrated that it has uh, a superior capacity, uh, as compared to the other parties in Antigua and Barbuda, uh, to engage young people uh, directly, to send persons out in the constituent to speak them, to get their names, to, to, to encourage them to register, to invite them to meetings, to invite them to parties, to, to give them whatever it is that they need that would bring them over and to begin to tribalize them, to get it into their heads that uh, it's us versus them, it's this team versus that team. Because a lot of the politics in Antigua doesn't focus about policy. No. And you, you, you realize that we have a, a, a tribal <laughs> politics. It's not that you try to convince somebody to vote for you because uh, you have the best policy or that you keep your voters because you have the best policies and the, the, the results of your policies have been good. It's because you have tribalized your, your, your following. You have told them it is us versus them. It is my distribution of state resources to my people versus their distribution of state resources to their people. And if you let them get into power, you will be left out in the right. cold because they will do for their supporters and they will let you starve. Um, so engaging is critical. And I think, of course, if the United Progressive Party wants to uh, see its, its, its vote share increase and perhaps gain a few seats in the next election, it is definitely to have to address that issue of exciting young voters. And I think that critically... Uh, you ask the question of um, what do they need to do going into the next election. A, a number of things. And I, I go back to what I said before. A great disservice was to pull up a slate of individuals, and I make no apologies for saying it, who are inarticulate and unimpressive. And it must be said. They are I inarticulate and unimpressive. I can't say it enough. Inarticulate and unimpressive. All right? <laughs> now, you have a, a leader. You have a leader of the United Progressive Party, right? I... I have nothing personally against the leader of the United Progressive Party, but I believe that the party needs to, at some point, consider so. whether or not the current leader has the capacity to excite the population, all right? In terms of being practical and pragmatic, I just made a statement that Antiguans tend not to vote on policy, all right? Gaston Brown is a celebrity. Gaston Brown is loud. He's bombastic. He's all over social media. People just adore the fact that they have an outspoken commander-in-chief, if you want to call it that, who is willing to say anything and who exerts great power, this maximum leader. They like that image. Now, you can have different images that you sell to the people in order to get votes. Um, and I think the United Progressive Party needs to question what image does Howard Lovell present to the populace of Antigua and Barbuda that commands their attention, that, 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 that just gravitates them towards the voting box and says we must go out because mm -hmm. the leadership of this man has convinced us that his party has the answer to our problems. If he is not bringing that sort of leadership and if he is not able to shake off the baggage that comes with the fact that he was a top member of the previous administration, which was overwhelmingly voted out of office, mm -hmm. well, then they <clears> need to get a new leader. And I think they don't realize that. Carl, and, um, do you see either the DNA or the UPP or any other opposition group that may spring up getting the necessary support and resources, financial and otherwise, to, to pose a viable challenge in the next election? Well, I, I hope so, because the state of democracy in Antigua and Barbuda needs it. We need to have a strong opposition in Parliament. We need, we need to have a strong opposition voice. But I... I take the points of my colleague panelists that the United Progressive Party and other parties have got to um, have got to listen to these young people who have all these ideas. Have got to listen to why they didn't get the vote last election and make some changes. And the question is, are they listening? Right. So we'll see at the next round um, whether they did listen and they are making uh, you know they're, they're going to bring for key ones' sake articulate and impressive <laughs> candidates. And uh, we're not going to to see um, <laughs> <laughs> you said that the other senses are the articulate and impressive quote unquote people stepping up to the plate mm -hmm. so you know the, the United Progressive Party has a candidate selection or any party for that matter and it selects from the available pool of people if the, the quote unquote articulate and impressive people are too, too concerned making money or indeed too, too, too fear, fearful of victimization or professional um, damage 
to step up and take the active reins. And this is for those who can to do so, right? So, um, so this is the two problems here. So the, the question is, are we attracting people? And indeed, are the people who need to step up, stepping up and taking the mantle to challenge the, the incumbent government? Uh, as for the DNA, I really don't see, and I, this is my bias, I don't see third parties making that big of an impact as, as opposed to spoiling and splintering the opposition vote. I've said so before, there needs to be an amalgamation, a meeting of the minds and a uniting of forces between those two organizations because any three or multiple parties going into the next election is going to only help the Labour Party. The opposition needs to unify and it needs to listen to the, to the voices that are saying reform, reform, reform. Please bring some reforms and not the same old, same old that we've seen in the past if you want us to take you seriously next time around. Can I add okay, that? one second, because we're almost out of time here. And I just want to put a last question to Kim Lisa uh, and then I will come to you, Kamali. Um, what, are, what is the consequence uh, if we continue to see the opposition continue to weaken? What is the consequence of governance in the country? Well, I just think it's going to just continue as it is right now. Because right now, I don't see them making an impact of any kind. They're just noise. They're just white noise. They're just in the background. And Kamali, your take on the importance of a strong opposition, if we continue to see it weaken, if we continue to see it decline, what are, what are the consequences for the country? 20 years of labor rule. <laughs> yeah. You have 28 <laughs> years of, from 1981 up until the 2000s. What we are going to have if the opposition continues on the present track, you're going to have 28, if not 40 years Kareem? of labor. No, I, I, I just think, I, ideally, what we want is, is progress for Antique and Barbude, and with that, you need a strong opposition. And uh, hopefully, out of this, you know, even when you, if you look at the Faithful Nationals March, uh, who knows, we may have an uh, amalgamation of UPP and all of these other individual uh, organizations, including the DNA, which would be perhaps the, one of the most dramatic things that have happened in the past 10 years that would pose an effective challenge to the, to the anti and Labour Party. Carlon um, and Kieran, very quickly, both on that question, um, what happens if we continue to see the opposition weakened? Does that, does that inevitably lead to excesses in the government, or, or, or is that a false worry there? Carlon first. Well, we go back. We go right back to, the, to where we were before. A one party, one family state. Except that it won't be the birds, it will be the browns. And that is a very frightening proposition for anybody who loves democracy. Kieran? Uh, I, I would just echo the, the statements of all the previous panelists, uh, particularly Carlin, who just spoke. Um, uh, the, the democracy benefits from having a, a strong opposition which presents the constant threat to the government that if your policies are not benefiting the people you will be replaced um, and if you don't have that what you're going to have is a government in power that gets extremely comfortable that understands that really and truly there's 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 no chance of it leaving power and if you have power and there's no chance of you losing it well then you do whatever you want well with that we have come to the end of this segment so i'll say thank you to public affairs commentator colin knight author kim lisa mings Political Studies student Kieran Murdoch, Youth Ambassador Kamali Mannix, and Social and Political Affairs Commentator Kadeen Joseph. Thank you to all of you for joining us today.